Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Maximum Gain, the show with an introspective look at rock and metal music as well as other genres, along with special discussions on film and other forms of entertainment as experienced by your host. And I am your host, Arya. Let's hear that opening theme, please. I'm really, really psyched about today's episode. Really psyched. So right now, I'm actually recording this intro for this episode after I've already finished the rest of the episode. <laughs> you know, and I'll explain why. Uh, explain why it's like this and why it kind of sounds weird. So today's episode is actually an interview. Uh, an interview that I've already conducted with the one and only Demon Stealer. Demon Stealer, a.k.a. Sahil Makhija, he is actually a veteran heavy metal guitarist and vocalist. He has been in, uh, he has been in the thick of it, you know, in the thick of the death metal Indian music wave, you know, <laughs> the death metal Indian band wave for the past 20 years now. For the past 20 years, and that's, that's just actually over 20 years. You know, and that's insane. I had the pleasure to sit down with him uh, via Zoom, of course, <laughs> via Zoom. Uh, I got to sit down with him and we were talking about all sorts of things. Today it was really, really cool. I got to ask him a lot of questions about, so, about where he grew up, what kind of music was going on there, how he uh, actually then ended up, you know, making it as a guitarist for Demonic Resurrection, probably one of the most well-known Indian metal bands of all time. They were really big at one point. Those guys performed at a bunch of different festivals. Uh, we spoke about uh, them performing at Wakin, Wakin Air, which which is a, apparently the biggest uh, metal festival in Germany. And Germany is a real <laughs> metalhead country. It really is. So they performed there, they performed at Bloodstock in the UK, they performed the UK many times. And actually one thing that I didn't bring up in the interview, but I, um, I want to just bring up right now, those guys, uh, Demonic Resurrection, actually got honored with the Golden God Award uh, by Metal Hammer in 2010. Now this was like the Global Metal God Award, you know, so it's like artists outside of the UK. Metal Hammer is a uh, UK uh, metal publication uh, media entity. And those guys, you know, Demonic Resurrection, they got that award. And, you know, it must have been huge. Uh, follow uh, Demonic Resurrection and Demon Stealer on Instagram. You'll find some pics of them actually, you know, there, like in 2010, in the UK holding their award. So that, so they, they so basically this guy, Sahil has been around for ages, you know, and he's still making music today. He's doing it uh, by himself, you know, and, and releasing amazing, amazing albums, EPs. He's actually, uh, right now, he's going to be releasing his latest EP, which is the Holocene Termination. We talk a bit about that also and how fascinating it was for the production of that. You might want to actually listen to that. It's really interesting stuff. And we speak about a lot more things and a lot of stuff that uh, a, a lot of things he likes uh, in terms of metal. Uh, you'll be surprised actually what kind of music he started listening off to and now where he is now. It's, it's, it's a really, really interesting conversation we had. So I can't wait for you all to hear it. So without um, <laughs> me wasting any more time, let's get right down to it. This is the... Maximum Gain podcast interview with Demon Stealer. Also, just one warning, there is a slight bit of foul language in this episode. Only a bit. So, uh, yeah, I just thought I'd let you know that before you played it on full blast in your living room. Now, enjoy. Yep, I'm rocking and rolling, ready when you are. Nice, good. So, Sahil, Makija, thank you so much for being on the show, the Maximum Gain podcast. 
it's a, a new so this is a new uh, thing for me new show for me and to have you on as um, so for my second episode to have you on this is really uh, something for me so thanks so much for for accepting to do this uh, uh, my pleasure thank you for having me yeah man sure sure so uh, yeah so the thing is that like uh, i just wanted to like ask you a couple of questions and just uh, know more things about you just like you know all the listeners want to know and like just like you know know some stuff about your past and what you're going up to now so i wanted to start off by asking you so where where are you from where were you born where are you from where did you grow up uh, i'm born and brought up in bombay city uh, lived here all my life pretty much uh, till this year i lived in the same house as well so <laughs> uh not much of a traveler or, or and stuff but yeah pretty much bombay uh bombay boy so to speak oh nice nice okay i actually recently uh so i'm mainly from uh, bangalore actually i've lived most of my life like 18 years 19 years in bangalore and then it was a big right. uh, uh it was actually kind of qu- quite a shock for me to move from bangalore to mumbai because the people i felt like personally i felt like the people in mumbai and all um i don't know if you've ever been to bangalore but I've been there for like uh, many times. You've been there many times, yeah. Bangalore has a huge uh, rock and metal uh, underground following, more than most cities in India, I think. So yeah, yeah, I've been going there for like twenty years, man. Now, so oh damn, okay, <laughs> nice. I uh, I that that's why we're coming to Mumbai. I realized like uh, at least in Bangalore, most of the people I I was ever with and all they weren't very. kind of polite you know generally the 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 people around bangalore you know i didn't get that kind of vibe coming to mumbai it was a completely different uh environment you know with, with people who always want to help and stuff like that that's something i i noticed instantly when i came to uh mumbai um so okay so you're a uh, all right mumbai born mumbai bred nice <laughs> uh <Yeah. laughs> so okay so when you were growing up what kind of music was like uh, going on in your household and what kind of music did you remember like in your childhood days your parents playing or on the radio that was playing a lot yeah so my mom's actually quite the rocker herself and uh, she was a huge music fan so there was always music in my house um, i grew up listening to mostly western music to be honest uh, in okay. fact it was it was i who liked the bollywood stuff back then <laughs> as a kid i i loved bollywood movies and i like bollywood songs so i would you know collect cassettes of uh, my favorite movies there used to be a shop opposite the road uh from me and i would go there in the evenings and check out tapes that would be available but my mom always had like cds of you know like sting the police aretha franklin uh oh. chris ria meatloaf like all all those series were at home she used to have lps lps sorry not lps she used to have lp lps back in the day but then i think mm. at some point she just stopped using lps and shifted over to series and tapes only cassettes uh, yeah. and there would be like yeah there would be like this shop that would uh, you could go there and you would give them a list of songs you like or that you have seen on tv or whatever and they would make you like a mixtape and stuff so there were like tons of mixtapes in my house as well from from that shop so i grew up around a lot of music you know my parents never like uh stopped me from listening to any kind of music and i was always like music was just a thing you were allowed to listen to music and you were meant to enjoy music so i loved like you know michael jackson and and uh, oh, nice. chris cross and two unlimited and all the <laughs> 80s and 90s sort of pop music uh it's only later that i got into heavy metal and unfortunately uh around the mid 90s before i actually got into metal my mom lost her hearing so she's oh. been unable to listen to music ever since because of that like she can hear and she has a hearing aid now but music just started to sound out of tune to her so she's never actually heard any of my music unfortunately oh man but okay. you know definitely a a love and appreciation for music uh that i have today is probably because of her and my father and having music around the house all the time you know whether it was in the car or whether it was at home or wherever else wow okay nice was there any like uh, did your parents um so your parents basically never had an issue with you going into music as a, like as a career or anything like that or, or did they have some other expectation from you like they wanted you to be a some other profession or something 
So my parents never had any like expectations in the sense that we want you to do X, Y, Z as your career or become a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, even when I got into writing music and stuff, my parents were always encouraging. They, you know, got me everything that I needed that they could afford. Um, the only thing they had was like, because it was death metal music, they were, they were pretty sure. And even I knew at that point that you can't make a living playing death metal music. So for them, uh, when I was sort of dropping out of college and flunking all my uh, exams, we definitely had some conflict, but it was not that we want you to stop playing music or like, you know, it was like, you do your music, that's fine, but make sure you study and get a good job so you can pay the bills and you can right. live a proper life. And also in, in that sense, uh, there was never any restriction. Even when I was, uh, listen, I, I wrote fuck your God on my cupboard. <laughs> and I wrote Bastard of Christ on my cupboard when I was oh. 16 years old and they didn't bat an eyelid. That's a fun house. Like my mom said, I don't like that. But like, she never said, you know, like she didn't hand me like a bucket of soap and say, remove that immediately or like mm. you're grounded. Nothing. This is that I don't like that. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Very open-minded and just, yeah, accepting of, you know, another person's perspective of things yeah, yeah like they, they're like do what you want with your life just be happy and make enough money so that you're not out on the streets you know yeah you can support yourself yeah 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 that that was actually uh honestly like um i relate to that quite a bit because uh so i'm actually also a musician I, i've been playing drums since i was about eight years old and i play wow. uh keys uh, keys for the past two years or so and the thing is that my parents also i, I remember telling my parents when i was i think 15 or 16 that I wanted to get into music like professionally, be like producing music or at least get into the sound field. So uh, one big thing of mine, actually one big ambition is to be a, well, I actually currently am a film composer. So the oh, wow. thing, yeah. So the thing is that actually um, when I joined uh, a school, when I was doing my 11th, there I had taken music as uh, one of my, you know, one of my credits. But that school screwed up so much uh, on just providing me the right teacher for certain subjects, including music. And I remember like telling my parents, like, I badly want to do music. Let me just study. Let me just do this, you know. But and, and also, I didn't want to disappoint my parents because at the time, at least I was 15, 16 years old. I, uh, I was thinking my parents would be like kind of angry that like, you know, if I'm not able to do the music thing and all. And they immediately told me like, you know what, if the school is failing you, then you shouldn't be putting up with the school anymore. You you why don't you just get out of the school this was some sometime around tw end of 2017 or something when i realized things were going downhill in the school then they said why don't you just go to mumbai check out some musicals music schools there so that's what kind of led me also to you know my parents were constantly encouraging me you want to do music go to wherever the main hub is you know or wherever yeah, no that's absolutely yeah that's that's yeah. actually great i i think back then for me at, at that point actually we didn't even have the uh, op option of going to a music school like there were no music schools there were no mm. uh, you know today they even parents today are well aware of the opportunities available for alternative careers whether that's acting or music or sound effects or yeah. any of any of the offbeat stuff whether it's events or uh, whether it's artist management all these things today there are schools there are more people doing it you know back when I was doing it it was like my parents didn't know anybody else who was a musician. So, uh -huh. you know, the only option at that point was to go to Chennai and uh, join SAE, which was the only uh, school in the country. And my parents couldn't send me abroad to study music, which was, you know, yeah. always out of the question. So I didn't want to obviously leave the band at that point. So that's why I wiggled out of going to Chennai and learning sound engineering. But at the end of the day, you know what, it all worked out. And I think the most important thing is that parents support what their kids want to do, you know? Mm, yeah, yeah. Really important. No matter what field you, you want to be in, yeah, that support should be there. At least for you to realize that I can give it my all in that thing. Yeah, and and because there, there are options. There are options in every field to make a career and to make a good living as well. Yeah, yeah, there really is. Yeah, and especially now. You're right. Back then, yeah, I have no idea what the situation may have been. I'm mainly a 2000s kid. <laughs> so, so, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so... I, uh, now I want to actually move on to like, so what was your introduction into metal? So what were, who, who showed you metal first and like, what was the, did you start off with death metal or did you slowly graduate to that? 
No, no, I obviously didn't start off with death metal. Um, well, I actually, I think my first introduction to anything rock was obviously my parents, you know. Uh, so I was always into bands like Aerosmith, U2. I, I remember actually very distinctly my mother getting a mixtape from that shop when I was very small. And I think there was a Green Day song on that. And I just remember how my mother hated that song because it was so <laughs> weird. But it, 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 you know, kind of like, I mean, it has nothing to do with my journey into metal, but that's one of my memories of like the first, I guess, non-conventional songs that I heard, you know, right. that even to me, like, was so weird because of the way he sang it. And, you know, I guess my mom was not into punk and stuff. She was like into <laughs> Doors and Deep Purple. And so oh, this was yeah. a, a first kind of taste of something a little different. But it was in the sixth standard that I first heard proper heavy metal, which was uh, Iron Maiden's first album. Uh, a friend of mine just gave me his Walkman to listen to. And the first two songs, Running Free and Phantom of the Opera, I very distinctly remember just being absolutely blown away by the sound and the heaviness and all the things that make mm. Iron Maiden great, you know. Like it was so catchy and melodic, but yet so heavy and it had so much energy and, and pump to it. And yeah. Phantom of the Opera, I think almost went over my head because that intro riff is just so, It if you've never been like studying music, that riff sounds so complicated and like crazy, <laughs> you know. So I, I remember that, but I think after that tape, I didn't actually get into metal at all. I actually got more into techno and pop and I was listening mm. to Backstreet Boys and the Spice Girls because that was what was cool in school, I guess. Yeah. But it was in the ninth standard that my friends reintroduced me to metal with like Metallica and more Iron Maiden. So I think it was Seventh Son of a Seventh Son and Metallica's Load and Reload albums or just Load, I can't remember right now. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that's how I kind of started. And then, you know, I got into heavier and heavier stuff as I went along. Wow. Okay. So actually, when you mentioned earlier that your your mom listened to Meatloaf and stuff like that, I I don't know any uh, any woman or anyone who's who hears Meatloaf and Deep Purple and all. Like personally, I don't know. So that that's really cool. Um. So uh, okay. So just a quick question, just a side question. So you mentioned Iron Maiden, and clearly, yeah, they were an influence on you melodically. You know, your your music with uh, like Demonic Resurrection, I've heard, as well as your solo uh, solo stuff. So okay. Uh. Iron Maiden recently released Senjutsu. Uh, have you checked that out? I I gave it a listen or two, yeah. Okay. Did it? Uh, I enjoyed I mean, it. I enjoyed it. I, I, I Brave New World. I kind of just lost interest in Iron Maiden. Um, okay. You know, and it happens to a lot of people. Like you, you start off somewhere. So a lot of bands uh, like Maiden that I used to listen to on like a regular basis. That was my you know go to music. I don't listen to as often, but I still keep in touch, you know, so like even Metallica, Sepultura, Pantera, mm. Fear Factory, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of the Madeline Manson, I was a huge Madeline Manson fan, um, you know, a lot of these bands I, I still listen to, but like I don't put it on regular rotation, you know, I, I listen to it because somebody will play it at a club or a restaurant or, you know, because stuff like Metallica and Iron Maiden now is more uh, acceptable yeah. music mainstream wise as well, you know, so yeah. Um, I mean, I still follow Metallica, I still follow Maiden, but I'm not like the same, I don't have the same craze now that I did back then. You know, now there's a lot more other stuff that sort of gives me that excitement, you know, the tech that music that I'm listening to, or right. some of the black metal, you know, I, I'm definitely more in the extreme metal space now. So, but I, again, I still listen to, you know, Maiden and stuff, but yeah, I guess not as frequently as I used to. Nice. Actually, yeah. Um... Over the past two years, I recently got into Machine Head, Fear Factory. I'm I'm actually even though like I uh, so I was born in '99 and I've grown up with you know music in 2000s and stuff like that. And generally 2010s was where I discovered metal. But I keep gravitating towards 90s metal bands for some reason. Maybe it's because the groove of a lot of bands around there, like Pantera, really uh, introduced the groove metal aspect at least to the mainstream, right? So I was uh, wanting to actually know your opinion on one thing. Uh, at the, in the end of the 90s, the new metal movement started, you know, and I want to know, did that ever have an effect on you positively or like, did you like any of those bands that came out of that movement? 
so back then i hated new metal i hated it with a freaking vengeance like <laughs> it was my it was to me as as uh, as bad as pop music was like i hated all new metal uh then that's the thing right like a lot of metal heads and obviously even till today obviously i've grown up i don't have the same opinion but like yeah. you know metal is is metal heads are often like you know metal rocks and everything else is garbage you know <laughs> and you don't you don't want to like what is popular you like metal mm-hmm. because it's not popular because the mainstream doesn't get it or whatever yeah and new metal was literally it felt like that you know it's like metal has been dumbed down to have angry lyrics that teenagers can like you know like oh like people equal shit and all those <laughs> you know slip <laughs> rats classic like it, yeah like it it felt like you're just playing one chord on the guitar and you know jumping up and down and like that's what we looked at it as you know mm-hmm. obviously today as a musician as someone who's matured and grown up i i can see the good stuff from that era as well you know obviously you know the the bands that really were the pioneers of the movement are still there you know like the music of system of a down is still relevant uh, yeah. slipknot corn yeah like, till today i i don't really like corn i can't sit through a corn song okay. uh, but i i do like a few slipknot songs i can definitely see how instrumental they were in inspiring so many kids and so mm. many musicians who are playing extreme metal today you know yeah like yeah. for for us it was metallica iron maiden that were the gateway bands into heavier music um, and you know for the generation of the 90s it was probably new metal so Yeah. um at that point though i hated it and i hated it hated it even more because like being in a local band you know there was yeah. always this competition with your peers and we we see bands like pdv start their set with like a corn song and the mm. whole crowd would go <laughs> absolutely nuts and then we, when we would play people would be like hmm cool like they would be you know you'd get like of course now i'm like okay yeah you know what maybe we just weren't that good a band back then and pdv was a better band but mm. back then you're like i'm i'm doing the same stuff i'm as good you know you have that yeah. feeling so yeah so I, everything was like sort of geared towards disliking new metal but uh today i i look at it much differently you know nice okay okay i that's why i just wanted to hear your perspective on that because uh, i just wanted to know like during that time new metal was huge and yeah corn yeah. they hit number 1 on billboard 200 like two years in a row Uh, you know consecutively and stuff and i uh, p- personally like actually um that whole lot of bands corn deftones even though deftones is definitely very alt metal right now but corn yeah. deftones uh, sword slipknot they are these are the bands that i really grew up with corn is actually my favorite yeah. band uh, of all time because of all the reasons <laughs> you specified <laughs> you know, but, uh, so uh i don't know i just you know every every person has their yeah, own yeah i mean I, i totally yeah. get it man like Yeah, you know. Uh so so the thing is um okay, so so that okay, I just want to know your take on like the new metal yeah. stuff. Yeah. I I think the only band whose music I liked back then was System of a Down. <laughs> Because System of a Down was still a little off of the the standard new metal off kind kilter. of sound. You know, they were yeah, yeah they were yeah, they were definitely a little bit different from everyone else. Yeah, yeah. And I like the fact that uh System of Down I mean at least when I started hearing System of Down beginning they were I mean just very loud and crazy and stuff but like you delve deeper into the lyrics it's quite deep the stuff Yeah there's, there's a lot more going on there yeah Yeah a lot more going on there and they're just such a melodically awesome band heavy band So okay uh so I wanted to ask you now like moving away from music When did you realize you had a passion for cooking because I actually found out about you through Headbanger's Kitchen on YouTube where it's it's like close to like 700,000 subscribers right now right it's like really close Yeah 6 so, 650k 650k closing in on Not bad man that's really good uh so <laughs> had to mention that sorry I just found that like really cool so I want to know yeah uh, how did you get the interest in cooking So I actually was into cooking way before I was into music. Um I actually as a kid loved food and I I can't even remember when I started cooking but it's just something I started when I was really young like I think my first memory of cooking was when I was about 10 years old or something I was on a family vacation and I uh, cooked breakfast for like 13 people you know. 
Oh. All my parents and their friends, yeah, I took eggs to order and I was making omelets and fried egg and all for everyone based on what they wanted. <laughs> That's the earliest kind of memory I have. But I remember asking my mom, but even she doesn't remember when I actually started cooking. Uh, mm. I guess as as a food lover, I was also very particular about what food I liked. And uh, I guess it's also finally it applies in my music also. Like I, I just do everything myself, you know. So <laughs> I guess I just started cooking because like I wanted to, like I knew what I want to eat. So I would just make it. Yeah. And I think because of that, I sort of enjoyed cooking. And then uh, we had an option to take like hobbies in school. There were hobby periods we had where I took uh, cooking as a hobby. And um, I actually wanted to become a chef and open my own restaurant and uh, while i was in school i had that uh, kind of career plan till i discovered computers and the internet around the ninth grade around the same time that i discovered metal okay all right so so currently like um what would you classify yourself as in terms of the culinary arts like a food blogger or you know or uh... yeah i mean look I, at the end of the day i'm uh, what pays the bills is my YouTube channel. So I guess you could say I'm a YouTuber or a YouTube mm. chef or a YouTube cook or whatever. Uh, but I also do food blogging. I have another uh, channel called Headbanger Eats where I do lots of food review kind of stuff. So yeah. you could just say, I mean, I mean, it's all of it rolled into one. Like, I, I don't think any one term will, you know. Uh-huh. But like, if yeah. you ask, what, what what do I write on my uh, visa application? I write YouTube. <laughs> nice. Good. Uh, I, I was actually, uh, I want to ask about that because like, uh, there's a lot of people who also said like, I mean, they have very established YouTube channels, but YouTube isn't the only thing that pays the bills. And, you know, it's the other things that they have to prep for themselves, like uh, either their Patreon or something like that. Right. So I want to know, like on top of YouTube, the other stuff you did. So you also uh, on like Instagram, you do these um, on Headbanger Eats, you do the food blogging stuff, right? Yeah, so all that stuff actually doesn't pay any bills. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the, so, uh, you know, the thing that actually pays my bills is literally the YouTube channel and my website, headbangerskitchen.com. These are the two things that are my uh, are the, the bulk of my income, basically. Everything else is largely more of a hobby related thing. Like what I do on Headbanger Eats, I don't get any money from that. You know, you just love it. At best, I get. I, I love it and I, at best, you know, some restaurant or person will send me food to taste and try out. Like that is the, I guess, the perk of doing it. Um, even music, honestly, is more or less if I can break even and not lose money on it. Mm. That's uh, that's good enough for me at this point. And uh, it's, it's really, yeah, the Headbangers Kitchen, the YouTube channel and the blog that kind of make up make up the income. And, and there is additional income from the kind of uh, affiliate related stuff with these two platforms and i do things like i write cookbooks which occasionally you know pay you some money so yeah but okay. but more or less that's what i do you know Wait, so you have a cookbook out you have a cookbook i have three cookbooks yeah oh nice okay i i actually cook quite a bit so i think i might just <laughs> check oh, that awesome. out i had no idea about that <laughs> yeah, yeah for sure yeah so two of them i i, I just worked on them uh, and one of them is like my own headbangers kitchen uh, cookbook. Okay, nice. That's cool. Um, okay, so uh, moving back to music now. So you've been a part of like a lot of uh, different projects, a lot of groups, Dem- Demonic uh, Resurrection, uh, Reptilian Death, and like so, so many others I know. And plus your solo stuff. So I want to know, like, you've obviously played a ton of gigs over the past 20 years, right? 20 years. So what was the one gig that you'll never forget? Or maybe the one gig that really changed your life, changed your career. Maybe you got a lot of connections through that one gig or something that really stood out. Um, Honestly, I I don't think there is one gig that would sort of define that. And in fact, that's what I kind of realized over the years is that People have this kind of notion that if you play this festival or if you play that show like that, you, you've made it, you know. Mm. Yeah, that's not the case. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, like a good example is Wacken Open Air, the biggest metal festival in the in the world. You know, okay. the holy grail for every metal head, every metal band wants to play Wacken and all that. And if you're booked, apparently you've made it, which is, I would say, absolute nonsense. You know, okay. I mean, it's that's a great a festival. German? 
that's a german yes one? in germany yeah okay yeah yeah and and you know like uh, it is a great festival it is an incredible feeling to be on the stage over there but it doesn't change your life as much as you would think you know so we mm. played vakan in 2014 you know frankly we played to like 150 people in a tent oh. you know so okay. cuz cuz when you watch these festivals on online you're looking at you know the big headlining bands playing to the crowd of 60 70 80000 metal heads who are there you're not seeing yeah. all the small bands in the stage the bands that are opening up to, for for metallica yeah, or for and yeah not even opening you're on a different stage that's like a kilometer away from the main <laughs> stage and we played oh. on the third day of the festival the last day so imagine this this is people have been there for two days already they've seen all the biggest bands they are drunk out of their minds yeah. we are playing at 12 in the afternoon so most people are not even awake you know people are have slept at 3 o'clock after watching creator the previous night and they are hammered in their tents you know oh, <laughs> and man. we are on stage at 12 and just before us on the main stage was arch enemy playing at 11:30 oh. whose set run who set runs into our set so if you leave <laughs> to catch our set you will miss the best songs of arch enemy at the end and oh. when we are yeah when we are finishing up sodom is starting on the other stage so you know like people don't realize all this like you think oh vakan i've made it i'm going to like have a killer gig and all and you're like okay this is great but there's like only 150 people here the tent is quite empty you know mm, so it's not yeah. everything you think it is and then of course you're like man i want to come back and i want to play a better slot next time and then when you do that you'll be like i want to change and play the bigger stage so yeah you know you, there's there's a never ending kind of thing but i think i guess if you have to pick like a gig that is same memorable that kind of stands out for me personally obviously the first gig because that's what kick started the entire journey that kind of took away that I'm just a guy sitting at home making music to I'm really doing this now I'm playing gigs and and I'm I'm doing something you know yeah. and then I think in two, 2010 when we played our first ever international festival which was uh, Inferno Festival in Norway that had a lot more impact because that was the first time after 10 years of being in a band we were able to book a show in a foreign country huh. at a festival we've been seeing on YouTube and dreaming about playing Hmm. and we played to 500 people the room was full oh, okay you know? and we went to norway and you know there were guys who were like who knew the lyrics we sold merch like there were people after hmm. our set we saw these four kids wearing our t-shirts all together and <laughs> like they knew our songs and they were shouting one more song at the end of the set so, oh, so cool. that show definitely like yeah we didn't i i don't think we made connections that took our career somewhere else or anything hmm. but as a show it was something that was like a life changing moment you know nice okay i just yeah i wanted to ask you about that because um i also had like you know some certain ideas about that that now i'm realizing a kind of you know uh, <laughs> faulty um i uh, actually one of the I, i've been to a few uh, i haven't played um, many gigs but uh, i've been to a few uh, festivals in my life and stuff and one of the festivals that stood out actually uh, I don't know you may have been there even uh, in Goa sorry no was Goa sorry Uti in 2011 uh, and no sorry 12 and 13 there was the Mad Music Festival and uh, there actually that that festival really turned me on to a lot of uh, Indian metal bands like uh, Cryptos and uh, there were a, a couple of others that sadly aren't uh, playing today there was one called Bandaid that was also like a quite quite an extreme metal band So uh uh so yeah that festival was just I remember there actually I realized there were I think yeah there were two stages yeah there were two stages and I remember once there was this amazingly heavy um uh, metal band that I, that was playing and I was there it was the evening or something I was there with my brother we were watching them and we realized like there was one full field and stuff and there were like roughly about 50 to 100 people present and you know and there was so much space around and everything but then suddenly you know we we'd walk to the other stage and everyone else was there like <laughs> so many people hundreds and hundreds thousands of people i think and uh they were all there to watch uh oh yeah yeah i remember now <laughs> they were all there to watch indian ocean of all bands that sadly 
were taking the other stage when another newbie band was playing. So I I, I get what you mean about you know, sadly being on yeah. the yeah. So okay, okay, that's interesting. So okay, um, so for those who don't know, uh, demonic. Uh, sorry, sorry. For for those who don't know, Demon Stealer has a real history. So you are also known, uh, you know. I mean, you're known as Sahil, but you're also known as Demon Stealer, which is your stage name, right? Um, I actually didn't know yeah. uh, uh, until looking up a little bit. Is that so? Demons. So you have had the title of Demon Stealer since like the early two thousands, right? Since you uh, started Demonic Resurrection, like you were. Yeah, since nineteen ninety nine, I think actually. Since ninety nine, okay. So, uh, there you. Or ninety eight, I don't remember. Okay, so somewhere. Ninety eight or ninety nine, I don't remember when I called myself <laughs> the demon stealer. Demon stealer yeah. yeah, but yeah, around that time, basically, right? So, uh, I want to ask you actually. Uh, you started Demon Stealer Records, right? And uh, I think some yeah. of uh, at least the local releases of Demonic uh, Resurrection in India and stuff uh, was through was released through Demon Stealer Records. I want to know like. How did Demon Stealer, Demon Stealer Records come about? Did it come about because you had problems with other labels or finding other labels? Yeah, kind of. It's it's because that in, there was basically nobody in India who would put out a metal album at the end of the day. Hmm. You know, when we started out, there was no infrastructure. There were no alternative record labels. There was the opportunity was a lot less. Um, and I remember when my one of my friends. Uh, Saurabh, who had, who I used to trade CDs with all the time and you know exchange music with, hmm. he's like, man, Demon Stealer, dude, your name sounds better as a record label, man, like Demon Stealer Records, and I'm like, okay, cool. So when I put out the first DR album in 2000, which was me and my mother sitting and sticking inlays together on burnt CDRs, <laughs> I just put Demon Stealer Records at the back of of the record label of the CD just so it looks. A little professional, you know, like yeah. oh, Demon Stealer Records. Hmm. So I put that over there, and uh, fast forward to when DR puts out um, the second album, A Darkness Descends. Hmm. That point, I was like, okay. Uh, at the band, I also decided, look, we're going to do this properly. We're going to uh, press like CDs. We're going to spend money and print CDs, not copy them on the computer. We're going to get booklets printed from a proper printing press. Like we were going to go the whole way. Wow. And, you know, when it's been about the band, it's basically been me doing all the management stuff. So I was like, okay, cool. Let me also kind of make DSR, like Demon Stealer Records, a little more proper and kind of, uh, you know, use that as a, as a front to market and sell the album. So I got a logo okay. done and uh, we printed it on the CD and everything. And I used the record label to trade CDs with other record labels. And, you know, it basically I was operating as a, as an indie label would. And mm. once I was like, you know, with that album, I was like, you know what, this, I can do this for other bands too. So I started signing up other bands and um, that's kind of how the label came into existence. And, and honestly, there was nobody else who was going to do it at that point. So it was like, if you don't put out your own music, nobody else will. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, that's why I was uh, wondering. I, I, I mean, I, definitely thought there would be a necessity to you creating that in order to release your own music and yeah at the time it would have been really tough uh being a an honestly even act. today there is yeah even today honestly for every indian metal band there is no option they have to put out the cds themselves mm. you know yes you can try and sign with a record label abroad but there are very few bands that can actually achieve that um you know like the few bands if you can if you i can probably check on my one hand cryptos is signed to a record label Huh. Um, Gutslit has had a record label. Now they have to look for a new one, I think. Uh, Against Evil, Girish and the Chronicles, and e even Bloody. Like, it's under 10 bands hmm. that are assigned to record labels, and none of these labels are in India. So, in India, there's only one record label transcending obscurity. So, hmm. you know, you're still in the same situation as a band. You know, yes, today you can contact more smaller labels abroad as well and maybe you'll get lucky like some of these bands have yeah but the chances are most likely you have to put it out on your own you know so yeah it's 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 always been a diy effort anyway for bands and it'll all it is going to be that way for a long time yeah unfortunately i'm i'm also like uh realizing actually over the past decade at least um i, I mainly look at uh like us bands and uk bands and all 
generally the sales have also come down uh, quite a bit with with some of the big some of the bigger bands from you know the 90s and 2000s that have had lasting impact like we were talking about from the new metal movement and all there aren't too many new uh, metal bands that are coming in uh, to the conversation and are getting a lot of commercial success the only like the newest ones i can think of if you think of like uh, abroad like um, probably bmth is going strong and uh, yeah. you know like uh, kill switch engage i think is kind of going strong but i i think there are plenty man if you actually go on to spotify and look at the number of listeners there are plenty of bands that are uh, on their way there man like see the the thing is right now you still have your metallica iron maiden everybody's judas priest still touring yeah once these guys actually stop only then are you going to have that space open for other bands to step into right that's true yeah that's true you know and there are enough bands that are coming up that are pulling in people and and it's 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 definitely there but the the old has to die out for the new to come in first you know <laughs> yeah no uh, one thing i was I, i was looking at um so yeah you're right like uh, when it comes to streams and all definitely yeah there are bands that are and even some extreme metal bands that are getting quite a number of streams but uh, generally i mean also nowadays also i don't think everyone is picking up albums as much like full on lps as much i think everyone's going digital right so Uh, yeah pretty much so obviously you know the sales are going to not yeah. be the same as it's it's only actually one thing i know is only the old metal bands like like an iron maiden or metallica or corn that uh, slipknot that's able to actually sell a large number of lps and and your bundles and all because maybe because of their <laughs> old generation fan fan base or something i don't know yeah i mean as long as look as long as there are people who listen to physical formats they will be sales. so i this is an interesting thing because i remember testament actually yeah. in maybe a couple of years ago i think when they put out dark roots of the earth uh, mm. they actually said that their physical sales were the best they'd ever had in their entire career and they've been around for 30 years and wow. that's because they they have gotten more popular as a band now they were in fact kind of overshadowed in the earlier days you know because of bands like metallica megadeth anthrax slayer and all yeah but yeah. as time has gone on they've gotten more popular so they've actually sold more copies of their uh, album in in some of the recent uh, years so it's mm. it's interesting you know and and at the end of the day while you might see that okay for a metallica i made in the physical sales may have dropped because consumption of physical media has dropped there are growth there is growth in other areas that you know like the spotify mm. or the apple music or the youtube or wherever so they, they're not losing out uh, in the same way you might think you know That's true. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. The looking at it from from other avenues, yeah, there definitely still quite a number that are getting in the streams and getting in the yeah. success. Yeah. Uh, actually, you so you mentioned Testament. I um suddenly remembered another band. Uh, Cannibal Corpse released uh Violence Unimagined in 2021 uh, this year, and they actually also said they had their highest opening week sales of like 15k. which was like 15k in the US yeah. alone which was quite impressive i didn't know like and they're they're about like 35 years old now right like yeah, quite yeah. old they were 25 30 years old yeah yeah I, i mean i remember finding out about cannibal corpse through ace ventura i don't know if you <laughs> uh, yeah most most people have found out through ace ventura yeah yeah so sad actually uh, i've noticed a lot like metal right whenever metal is shown in any uh, movie or anything right in any kind of um film or tv series it's always looked upon like kind of negatively or just aggressive for the sake of aggressive like i've noticed movies like for example um there's some recent ones i was thinking of um uh sound of metal which is is a uh, i don't know if you've seen it with riz ahmed i haven't seen it yet no i it's, i need to watch it it's on my to watch list yeah it's on amazon uh, so thing is that like that movie uh, it's about a, a heavy metal drummer that uh, loses his hearing but there it's yeah. kind of like with the it's kind of like uh saying that it's because of the music he chose to perform all this time that caused them to lose his hearing you know they kind of giving metal as the reason uh, at least right. i felt and uh, there was another movie also recently called uh, the art of self defense uh so small film with jesse eisenberg that movie also kind of showed uh metal that movie is all about toxic masculinity and there it's like a, it's kind of over the top but they say like all men need to listen to metal and they show all the men as assholes and and stuff in it you know and 
that kind of a uh, thing i feel like will do you think will ever go away that like metal isn't always just negative negative or like satanic yeah i mean look i mean think about uh, people who are muslim they're always shown as terrorists in half the movies like yeah i mean you know like movies and tv like to sort of take sometimes the worst parts of uh, anything and sort of it's constantly exaggerated you know i know what you're talking about like in some other movie recently also this guy is a serial killer and he's got metal band posters in his room and yeah. you know like he's worshiping satan and also like yeah i mean that, that stereotype is is um, kind of hard to shake off you know like i mean think of it like there are far there are communities that are far more negatively impacted from their portrayal in movies than metal heads i think mm. metal heads yes you know probably just brush it off and don't care and the truth is you know what like it's i don't think it really matters over time it is going to fizzle out and you know it's mm. it's not going to be the same way and honestly i don't think most metal heads care and neither do i <laughs> good nice nice okay just had to mention that i mean i know <laughs> what you mean because because yeah. no no because i've got it i've got this like oh you listen to metal oh you don't smoke and drink what are you mm. saying man i'm like yeah i don't need to like smoke and drink to listen to metal you know or do drugs or or have tattoos or anything you know i mean there's this you can't like shake that stereotype it is what it is you know yeah yeah and also like over the years because of certain you know uh news news pieces on like say a melon manson or slayer that that stuff has like really at least i thought it had damaged the the name of metal and hard rock you know back in the 80s i don't think so man <laughs> i think in <laughs> fact metal is is notorious for this like i think part of the thing is that like people like that shock value you know i yeah. mean like a lot of metal artists do stuff for shock value it's, it's slayer is is a and marilyn manson are prime examples of like tom ayer is a devout christian <laughs> and he's singing anti christ i mean they, slayer said it in interviews they did it for shock value like it's yeah we're here have, to shock yeah. you when when you know then that's metal right like it's we want to not rosy things up we want to talk about the dark and deep and you know disgusting stuff that other people are not willing to talk about and you know that's cool man yeah yeah actually yeah that's one of the main reasons why i as well as so many other people have loved metal yeah, that i think only the only real issue is is not really the imagery and all it's it's like you said it, if 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 toxic masculinity is promoted through metal but the truth is there is a lot of tox- toxic masculinity in metal and true, it's yeah. what i realize is all these traits it's metal at the end of the day is music it's an imagery but all these shitty traits of humans whether yeah. that's you know being misogynistic or toxic masculinity or racism and all it's there in in the world and it's there in the world of metal as well yeah yeah you know it's not special badge that you wear because you're a better person than everyone else and that's i think something that that i think is a bigger problem with the metal uh seen than silly portrayals in movies like you know metal heads need to realize that yes they listen to music that's different but that doesn't make you a better person than somebody else or it doesn't mean other people are shit and and things like that you know yeah. like we have enough of all the real world problems in metal as well if you're willing to open your eyes and listen to what other people have to actually say yeah yeah that's true that's definitely true um i i remember also like few people talking about uh uh certain things about pantera also and then phil and salmo and also yeah you're right it's all prevalent and it's just that, like for me sometimes it bugs me because sometimes it's so concentrated on like one thing metal is evil metal is you know whereas uh, some of the most beautiful music i've ever heard actually is from the metal genres sub genres you know so yeah. oh yeah and trust me i get a lot of this because i have a lot of uh old christian ladies watching headbangers kitchen from time to time <laughs> and i'll always get like oh i hope jesus saves you stop worshiping the devil stop saying horns up at mm. your in your videos and all that so like just it's like pff, i don't yeah. even like <laughs> yeah yeah i know and at least with that channel it's it's mainly about the cooking so just like focus on that yeah. <laughs> like you know why do you have to comment yeah, yeah. about yeah. yeah yeah okay so actually so bring up uh, headbanger's kitchen again uh so you've met and prepared food for a lot of uh, 
big big uh, legends in the metal community hard rock community like joe from uh, joe de plante i think from gojira uh, the fear factory guys dino and burton and uh, um the singer from cryptos and like so many people right uh, so i just want to know was there any one of these uh, interviews that got you more excited than others or got you maybe kind of like nervous to meet the george, the george colius interview for sure george uh, that was i think the f- yeah the fourth episode i was doing or, or something and uh be i first of all i'm a huge fan of george he was like the first big celebrity guest on the channel uh mm. so i was super nervous and to top it off he was like i don't really like food <laughs> Oh god. I don't yeah. I don't eat. He's like I don't really eat much. I don't really like food. I just I'm very fussy about food. I like only my like mother's cooking like that kind of stuff and I was like oh my god. And I was like please just just take one bite of it, you know, like and he he was very kind and courteous and he took one one bite of everything, you know. Uh yeah. so <laughs> I was quite happy but yeah, I was really nervous interviewing him. Um you know, obviously later as the show progressed, I got a little more comfortable cuz Yeah. I've never been an interviewer before so I was like that was my first stint with ever being like a host of anything and mm. and if you go and if you go back and look at the first 3 or 4 episodes uh you'll see a change from then to today or even the later uh, episodes of Ed Banger's Kitchen you know the comfort yeah, yeah. and and just kind of the 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 level of sort of um how I, at ease I became later on you know yeah, it was just became skin. more casual Yeah, yeah yeah I've been watching your keto videos so yeah or your other your non keto videos uh <laughs> yeah so uh, uh, so you're a fan of Nile like George Coles is you're a fan of uh, Nile I think George Coles yeah, yeah, Nile, yeah. Right? I love I love yeah yeah George Coles even his solo stuff I really love uh, his solo album which came out recently like I think 3 or 4 years ago oh, okay. uh but yeah big big fan of George and that's kind of why we were able to get him for the interview as well because uh we were doing like i was with fatado's music at the time and we do like a uh a, a, a clinic and stuff at this uh, music expo in in goriga every year called the palm expo i don't know if it still happens but okay uh it used oh, to and we would always get yeah, yeah. It, it does happen yeah. yeah yeah so we used to always have a booth at palm expo and we would have some kind of international celebrity drummer or guitarist or somebody coming and doing like a workshop and clinic and uh, when my boss said let's sit down and figure out who we can get i was like let's get george colius he, he does pearl drums and you know we're just launching pearl and stuff it'll be great and yeah we called george and he said yeah he'll do it and his fee was very reasonable so we're like done we're booking him <laughs> so it was nice. awesome nice nice that's cool i remember some time ago actually uh, uh i don't listen to nile that much but like i remember there was a point when my brother uh used to listen to Nile quite a bit and he's also a huge metalhead and guitarist uh back i think in the early 2010s they came to uh India or i think they came to Bangalore to perform i think that was where much I... later actually 2015 or something i think they came oh, was it 15 oh, okay ha it, yeah, it was quite it was quite late because um, they there was like people have been trying to get Nile to India i think for the last 20 years <laughs> oh shit okay Wow. Yeah, but I don't think it ever worked out till that BOA finally happened. Like I, I, I remember there was a show around 2010 or something where Nile was booked also, DR was also playing, but that show got cancelled. It never happened. Okay. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. So okay. Um. So okay. Um. Demon Resurrection. Uh. It's been about four years since you released uh your uh, the last album Dashavatar. right uh so i want to know like so what well, what's the deal with uh demonic resurrection now you guys uh, continuing or is there like another album in the works or any more gigs hopefully post covid lockdown times um honestly i don't know man cuz there's no real band left anymore <laughs> <laughs> like like uh, i mean the actual band is is just uh, myself and viru um and vignesh joined us recently uh, who's been touring with us for a while 
Um, but he's moved to America now, so I don't really know how that's going to work out. Um, mm. Viru and I live very far from each other, and he is kind of really busy now with all his uh, bands that actually pay the bills. <laughs> so he plays for Darshan Rawal, who's like a pop singer, okay. and got like some two three million followers on Instagram last I checked. And he also plays for other uh, like he does sessions work for other artists. So. um that's what actually pays his bills so he's pretty busy with that you know and it's hard i guess to manage uh, anything else on the side musically because if you're if music is your job then once you're done with your job you don't want to again go back to something that's like your job so <laughs> i mean it's just viru and me for now uh what we're going to do i don't know but i don't see anything happening till 2023 at least okay 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 all right yeah okay Also, just a side note. I suddenly remember something. Uh, recently, you had put, um, I think, in your Instagram stories, like, so what song you had asked the uh, your followers, what song would be best to listen to when you're working out? And there were a bunch of people like who commented stuff. I commented some corn song or something um, that I, I that I listen to when I work out. But uh, someone mentioned, uh, I think, Septic Flesh, uh, their song Martyr. When I saw yeah. that, actually, like it brought back memories because uh, back when I was like nine or ten, uh, I was hanging out with my brother a lot, who was like, I mean, he's like seven, eight years old, uh, older to me. Uh, so he and his friends used to actually listen to bands like that, some really heavy uh, bands, and uh, like Septic Flesh was back in two thousand nine and ten. I'd heard a snippet of An- Anubis back in two thousand ten or something, wow. but I'd never. like i n- i didn't like it back then and i never thought to check like who is this band septic flesh or anything so suddenly yeah. when suddenly when it was mentioned on your stories like martyr by septic flesh for some reason i was like this something sounds familiar about this or the singer sounds familiar or something and then i checked them up on spotify i'm like oh my god this is that band 10 plus <laughs> years ago that i listened to like a snippet of anubis so i want to thank you and whoever else suggested that song because i'm a huge uh, septic flesh uh, fan now <laughs> So awesome, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now getting down to uh, some more interesting new news. Uh, you have an EP coming out, uh, solo yeah. EP, I believe. Uh, the Holocene Termination, right? Sorry, yeah. Did I get it right? Yeah, the Holocene Termination. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I listened to your single, and uh, yeah, man, seriously heavy stuff. Really, really good. I love the production on it. You know, like the production on the, uh, the song is great. Uh, I wanted Thanks, to. Man. Yeah, I I wanted to ask you. Um, so you've got a lot of drummers and uh, bass players, guitarists, mainly from the YouTube community, I think, uh, to actually feature on your EP. So I was wondering, uh, could you name a few and uh, just uh, say like why you chose to get other featured players, you know, for this one? Yeah, so I mean, I've always loved the idea of working with different musicians and especially drummers. Mm, I have a thing yeah. for drums and drummers. <laughs> My <laughs> wife always jokes about it, like you know, other men have mistresses, Sahil has drummers. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I'm always looking for awesome drummers to write songs with, and um, you know, these are drummers that I have. i have been seeing on facebook youtube and i just i just send them messages and whenever they reply and say yes i, I start working on a project you know uh, and kind of make things happen so i just wrote to eugene uh, so eugene repchenko uh, christoph um, simon uh, shilling and uh, robin stone are the drummers uh, and yeah i mean i'm on a de- i'm on a couple of drum communities and these guys are always posting there and i see their stuff so i just like send messages and say you know hey would you like to do a song together and you know what's your schedule like and stuff and yeah things happen nice like pretty much like even for bass like just like looking around on facebook youtube instagram oh oh dude this bass player is insane let me write to him and see if he's available to play like pretty much that's cool i uh, so thing is that actually the reason why i want to bring bring that up is because um So okay, uh, the Holocene termination, the single. Uh, did y- Eugene Rabachenko uh, drum for that one, or is it another? Yes, so one? Eugene is on. Yeah, so that song has Eugene on drums. It has uh, Jeff Hewell on bass, and it has Nick uh, from Equipoise on guitar, lead guitar. Nice. 
I, actually, back in 2016, 17 time, uh, I was really getting deep into uh, figuring out different fills and different uh, types of beats on uh, using the double bass on my drum set. So at that time, I was doing nothing else but watching Eugene Ravchenko uh, tutorials and, you know, videos on how to do this fill or how to drum like this or uh, flamming the right way and, you know, how to practice your double bass. I remember there's one video of him, like, playing the double bass for, like, 10 minutes yeah. straight while he's playing Angry Birds. And he's, like, at some <laughs> insanely fast speed, you know, so... <laughs> I remember practicing that stuff and also suddenly when, when you mentioned like Eugene's going to be on the thing, I was like, wow, you know, brings back like old memories. Yeah. <laughs> so that's cool, man. That's really cool. So Holocene Termination is out uh, December 3rd, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It's out on 3rd December. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So, uh, uh, so where would people be able to like purchase it or, you know? So you can grab a copy on my Bandcamp, which is demonstealer.bandcamp.com. And it's also going to be on Red Wolf for people living in India who don't have a credit card to buy things on Bandcamp. Okay, cool. I, no, I mean, I bought stuff on Bandcamp. I don't think I needed a credit card. Okay, yeah, but there are a lot of kids who don't have any kind of digital banking. So they may have a UPI, you know, like a oh, Paytm or a Google right. Pay. Uh, so you can then pick it up on Red Wolf, which makes it much easier, you know. Yeah, I just spilled some water like crazy. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, okay, cool. That's nice. Um, so, yeah, I now I actually wanted to move on to something fun just to close off, uh, close out the interview. I wanted to do a special game with you. It's like a rapid fire questionnaire called the Maximum right. Gain Questionnaire. Cool, so, bring it on. Yeah, so basically, okay, you have a maximum limit of five seconds, five to 10 seconds, but it's more fun if you can answer in five, uh, five, okay. 10 seconds, give only one answer to each question. So you can't be like this or this or something, just one answer to each question. Okay. All right. Should we start? Yeah, go for it. All right. So your one favorite Indian dish. Um, chilo kebab. Chilo kebab. Nice. Okay. If you want, like, from after From Copper you... Chimney. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> if... Specifically from Ch Copper Chimney because Chelo Kabab is actually an Iranian dish, but whatever Copper Chimney makes is definitely not an Iranian dish. <laughs> it's an Indian version of, of yeah. this dish. So that's why I said Chelo Kabab. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, if you, uh, if you want also, like, uh, after each answer, if you want to elaborate, but after you give the answer, that'll be cool. So good. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's basically it. That's nice. why Copper Chimney and that's why Chelo Kabab. Chelo kebab, nice. I've never actually had that. I think I'll, I'll check that out. I don't yeah. think anyone has had that except people who have eaten at Copper Chimney. Copper Chimney, yeah? Okay, I'll check out. And stuff. it's not as, and it's, actually, I don't know why I said that was a terrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, it's quite bad right now. Like, we ordered it recently and it doesn't taste as good as it used to. Oh, <laughs> okay. Which is a shame, yeah. Actually, I should retract that answer. I should just say Reshmi kebab because that's actually probably my favorite Indian dish. Reshmi kebab, okay, nice. Yeah. Not spicy and well-flavored. Not spicy, well-flavored. Nice. Okay. So, okay. So, next question. Your one favorite non-Indian dish? I... <laughs> Hamburger. Hamburg. Oh, no, no. Wait, wait. Ban Bangkok duck rice. Bangkok duck rice. Okay, that's quite... A, Bangkok okay. duck rice. Different. Okay, yes. Bangkok duck rice. So, it's, yeah, it's, it's this delicious duck breast cooked in a brown sauce served with rice. Dude, I'm terrible at this game. <laughs> no, especially, that's the thing. Especially, that this game, this game is sucked. This game sucks actually. You know, I mean, like getting the right answer out, you'll never get the right answer out. But it's nice to see, like, yeah, one because like, yeah, because I don't know why I said either of those two answers. It was terrible. It's not even right. <laughs> nice. Okay, it's all the Reish Me Kebab and right. uh, Bangkok duck rice. You said right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So now. A dish you've eaten so much of and are now repulsed by it. Uh, nothing. Oh, nothing? No. Oh, cool, cool. Okay. For me, like, I, I yeah. had, uh, like, uh, I remember there was a phase where I had way too much gulab jamun at one go. And now I can't have gulab jamun ever again. No, I, I think, I think even... Um, 
yeah i i have i've done a lot of like diet testing and trials so two things that i tried that were really awful was one was the egg fast where you eat only eggs in any form okay continuously for 5 days i could not get through the 5 days and then there was one called the potato diet where you had to eat potato boiled potato for again 5 7 days some rubbish like that i couldn't get past half a day i think or one and a half days i got through i don't know but i can still eat potato i can still eat egg there's literally nothing like even if i get sick of it if i don't eat it for two days i can go back to eating it then oh okay cool good lucky for you yeah. that i can't i can't do that like <laughs> after point if i'm sick of something i'm sick of something all right so favorite series you watched in 2020 favorite see a uh, squid games squid game oh 2020 this 2021 squid game is 2021 uh did stranger things come out in 2020 no that was 2019 no. <laughs> i mean like season 3 was in 2019 um what came out in 2020 i don't even remember what came out in 2020 was sex education in 2020 no that was this year so bridget Unless... or tiger king or the i mean last i only dance. remember tiger king now that you mentioned it so tiger king i guess <laughs> thank you okay I, i can't remember what came out in 2020 Yeah, that's true. Actually, I also am getting a little confused right now. What came? I'll out? have yeah. to Google and like see what came out in 2020. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed Tiger King since you remember Tiger King came. Nice, out. Tiger King. Nice. It was a hilarious watch. <laughs> yeah, and very shocking as well. Actually, yeah. it was it was deeply saddening. <laughs> yeah, a lot of messed up things happened. Yeah. Yeah, man. Okay, favorite Hindi film. Uh, Satya. Satya, written by I think Anurag Kashyap and uh, it's a Ram, uh, it's a Ram Gopal. Ram Gopal Verma, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is Ram Gopal Verma. But yeah, it's from yeah. the nineties or something. Yeah. Okay, nice. Satya. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, favorite English film. Lord of the Rings. Really. The okay. trilogy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's my probably my favorite movie of all time. Oh, nice. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I know. I, I remember going and watching it in the theater, like all the three movies back to back. Oh wow! Okay, that's uh, my brother yeah, was most likely doing the same thing at the time. That that's also his favorite trilogy or one of his favorite trilogies of all time. <laughs> yeah, it was nuts. But yeah. like, I mean, there are there are movies that come a close second, I guess. You know, Ma- Matrix, the first one, and Terminator Two, I think, could possibly be one of them as well. Okay, okay, okay. Nice. Oh, those good selections. Yeah. <laughs> All right, a movie that really let down your expectations. A movie that really let down my expectations. Uh, I feel like I saw this recently only, but I can't remember now. Hmm. Uh. Problem with me is I I don't have much hope for movies, so when I watch them, I don't really get disappointed. Oh, okay. I th- yeah like my my standard for movies is quite low so my disappointment levels are like I'm I'm trying to think it's the problem is it, it I won't remember any of the names I've watched some movies that I haven't gotten through like on Netflix some really bad comedy movies from the 90s and all hmm. like I watched 10 15 minutes and I'm like they can't watch this Okay so for example so, you you mentioned like a sequel like you mentioned Matrix uh, Terminator and Lord of the Rings right so were you ever disappointed by like were you ever hyped by the hobbit trilogy or like uh, matrix reloaded i and... i enjoyed all of them i think i was oh. like yeah it's okay it's cool i i think matrix matrix i recently rewatched the last two uh okay let i'll tell you what is definitely like not up to par was huh. definitely the gi joe movies ah okay so while i was able to sit through them and enjoy the money i spent on the ticket yeah they were quite bad The GI Joe movies. I've never checked those ones out, and I'm assuming I shouldn't check them out. E, well, if you don't mind watching a bad movie every now and then, sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, I like watching the so bad it's good movies. Like you know, there are certain ones that are like. Yeah. No, I, I'm pretty sure I had a better answer, but I can't remember it right now. So. Yeah. Okay, it's cool. It's cool. Let's move on. We have three more questions remaining. All right. All right. Okay. I, okay. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this. Uh, an album that really let down your expectations. Oh, an album that really let down my expectations. 
Um, really let down. I feel like I'm going to have to open up my Spotify to even have a chance of thinking of which albums I listened to recently. Um, I think this is very hard. <laughs> um, damn it! It's cool if you want. It's cool I do not have, move on. Yeah, I. I I actually don't have an answer for this because yeah I, I can't think of any album like that's the thing right like I I know there are a lot of bands that like change singers and like like especially like see a band like Nightwish you mm. know when people uh, see that the singer has changed they're like oh I'm so let down by the album because it's like yeah but I'm always like yeah man I actually don't care you know it's cool <laughs> I don't mind the singer change and all uh, I think um I, I, the one band that I didn't like really like carry on listening to, I think is Scar Symmetry. After they changed singers, I just I I don't know if I was disappointed, but I just I just didn't get into it after that singer left. Yeah. Hmm. So whatever album came out after the last album with with the solo vocalist on uh, Scar Symmetry, because they they had one singer, I think Christian was his name. And when he left, they got two singers. And I think that that first album that came out, yeah, that just didn't do anything for me. And I never really got back to listening to them after that. Oh, okay. So if I have to, yeah, if I have to put down a name, I guess that is the closest I can think of. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, favorite hobby? Fast. Uh, playing drums. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nice, nice. Yeah, I guess it's a hobby because I don't make any money from it. So <laughs> it still counts as a hobby. Okay. Nice. Okay. Nice. I've, se- I've seen you drum, by the way. I've seen some like small snippets oh. and stuff. Crazy. Crazy stuff, man. Thanks, nice. Man. Okay. So last one. Okay. I don't know if this is the best question, but I'm, ask- I'm asking it anyways. Being a chef or creating and producing music for the rest of your life? Being a chef? I'd rather, being- I'd rather be a musician for the rest of my life. That's what my passion has been for the last 22 years. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. Nice. Nice. Okay. I think the last one and the one in the beginning were the only ones you were able to answer in five seconds. <laughs> so it's cool. Yeah. yeah. I think I pretty much <laughs> failed the game. Yeah. But no, it's fun to know. Like, I, I, I want to know like how people like answer if you're given such a short uh, amount of time, you know? My thing is I can answer like other questions quickly. Like when you ask me to like remember specific moments, like obviously anything now with music, I've like answered them a hundred times. So I'm, I remember the same moments and like, you know, the key things, yeah. but like questions like this is like, cause my, my favorite stuff often changes hmm. any which way, like, you know, so it's hard for me to like recount. Like if you ask me like, Sai, what are the five albums you've heard this year that you like? I have to actually go to my Spotify, yeah. scroll for like an hour and see what I've listened to. Then try and say like, oh, which one did I like? Why did I like it? Like that actually takes me way more time to answer than yeah. you know, anything else. Yeah, yeah. I suppose I, get, I also get like some kind of satisfaction in, in the sense that whoever I'm asking these questions, they'll be so frustrated that they didn't give the right answer <laughs> during that time. But uh, cool, man. It's all cool. Um yeah. yeah, so uh, that's it. I I would I want to thank you so much, man, for uh, doing this uh, interview with me. It's really cool. Got th- no some worries, man. great stuff and I learned a lot also about like the history of demonic resurrection and like a lot of <laughs> other stuff. So that's pretty cool. So yeah, man, thanks so much. Hopefully, hopefully, maybe in the future we could do it again sometime. It'll be nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure, man. And thanks for having me. It was uh, a fun chat and uh, looking forward to doing another one in the future, man. Yeah, man. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Cheers, bro. See Bye. you, man. Cheers. Thanks. See you. Bye. So, guys, that was Sahil Makija from Demonic Resurrection, Reptilian Death, and his solo projects with uh, Demon Stealer. Thank you so much for watching that means a lot thank you again to sahil for doing that that was awesome got to learn a lot about death metal and a lot about you know what he grew up listening to so yeah i hope you all join me for the next episode of maximum gain it's going to be either a one-off or another episode of since 99 can't wait to give you all another bit of maximum gain podcast and as always i hope you stay happy and i hope you stay safe 